this for the first time not and don't know what row 64 is row 64 is a is the world's largest big data spreadsheet that's powered by python and what we do is we simplify data science by bringing you easy to use data science recipes we have all different types of uh, beautiful charting functions and we leverage the gpu to accelerate actual data processing so Let's just jump right into our intros. My name is Paul Turin. I am the Director of Business Development at Row64, and I have about 15 years of experience in the financial advisory services consulting, consulting industry. Uh, I got my bachelor's in finance from Cal State University Northridge and an MBA from uh, Grazia Dio's uh, School of Management, where I focus again on finance. Um, and I just noticed in the industry, at least in finance anyway, there is definitely a large uh, need for Python coders or just people that know how to process big data. And throughout the years, in the last 15 years, I've noticed uh, that the best people today that are being hired and relevant to today's uh, just workforce are people that can handle big data and know how to use Python, R, and other sorts of visualization tools like Tableau. Row 64 is just trying to come to the table here to bring both the non-technical user and the technical users into one platform to share share common workflow and to you know really help each other uh, make great business decisions. I'm joined today by Brandon Kleinman, who is a an awesome data scientist, and I've been working with uh, Brandon now for about two three months, and his expertise is really in the machine learning and AI space. Uh, he has a background in statistics, R, Python, SQL, Java, C++, VBA, I mean, you name it, he probably, if he doesn't know it, he, he'll he learn it. It's kind of like, um, Brandon, would you say like most data scientists, there's not one tool that you really use. You have to use all different kinds of tools, right? Yeah, you have to be very flexible these days. Yeah, and I mean, it's just, and that's probably primarily because every industry has different tools, right? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Cool. So his background um, is he's a alum from Chapman, got his BA there uh, in data analytics and math. Um, and currently he's pursuing his master's of science and engineering at UPenn. And uh, is there anything you wanted to add to, to, to your bio today, Brandon? That's all. Thank you for introducing me. Yeah, dude. I really appreciate you taking the time, man. I really appreciate it. I'm hoping that we have a lot of fun today. And of course. Thanks for having me. You know, it's just more of like a, a conversation on like common data science workflows and what you end up finding out is that there's never yeah. there's never really a, a, a one cookie set like one cookie cutter or one size fits all approach to working with data right so yeah exactly so our agenda for the day just we just went over an introduction about row, what row 64 is uh we went over um our intros but what we really want to talk today is, about is data imputation what it is why it's important, what are some of the techniques and how you use them. And then there's gonna be an overall conclusion, which I think you'll be able to predict as we go through these slides, because at the end of the day, you're gonna find out that the answer is probably it depends on each technique. So let's just go ahead and jump right into what is data imputation. Oftentimes when you're working with data, you're missing, you're missing information. Maybe you're, you've got data from multiple sources, maybe, Maybe you got data that's just not clean. And when you try to marry that data, you end up having just missing values. So data imputation is the process at which a practitioner of data science uses to replace those missing uh, data with actual values, right? Or substituted values. And it's up to the data, science, data scientist to really decide on what method is correct and what would produce the best value um, in terms of what they're trying to accomplish or what, what sort of model or forecast that they're trying to build, what sort of machine learning model, for example, they, they may be making. So you have to really decide on which technique is the best to use, right? So I do want to highlight that, you know, we're going to be using um, row 64 a lot in this presentation, and we're just going to show off how uh, some of these techniques are done and you can visualize some of the Python that's behind that, but this is no, by no means a, uh, like, you know, a, I would say a replacement for going out and learning Python yourself. Uh, this is more uh, for conversation and 
understanding so that you become a well-rounded, powerful practitioner of data science. Right? So anything to add to that, Brandon? No, that was perfect. Great. So why don't you talk about why, um, why, why is data imputation even important? I mean, why can't we just like completely ignore everything and just like do what we like, forget it. You know, I, I got this data and I just, some of it's missing. I just, can we just ignore, ignore that? Right. So sometimes we actually can just ignore the missing data, but those are very, very specific scenarios in which, you know, the amount of data that's missing is, is very minimal. And the, the mechanism through which that data is missing is also uh, specific, which we'll actually cover later. But the two main reasons why we have to deal with this problem is that first, a lot of machine learning algorithms just won't run if we, if we put missing data in, into them. So the, it'll just kind of crap out and we won't be able to get any insights from those algorithms. And then the second one is that if those algorithms do allow for missing data, the the imputation me method that we use will will actually have a, a large effect on the outcomes of that analysis. So if we choose an improper method for imputation, there can be you know bias that's introduced, which will strongly affect negatively or in an overfitting style, the the outcome of our analysis. Yeah, because what you're trying to say is like, whenever we're doing these machine learning models or whatnot, what we're really trying to do is forecast something or predict some sort of behavior, right? Exactly. Right. And if you have bias, then obviously, you know, your your ability to be Nostradamus is, is impacted greatly. You just can't predict yeah. things accurately. Yes. If you don't have good data and you're not doing mm -hmm. the right technique, right? Mm-hmm. Great. That's awesome. So what are some of the important things to know? What's some mechanisms that um, we need to know uh, about data just in general before we go in and employ even any, any sort of technique whatsoever? Right. So there's three main mechanisms through which data can be missing. The first is the ideal scenario in which data is missing completely at random. The example that I'll use to illustrate all three of these is that we are working at a let's say a veterinarian office and we're measuring dogs. The missing completely at random example that I'm going to give is that sometimes the battery for the scale will just stop working. And that's just, you know, a function of, of time or of, you know, something else that's completely random that, that doesn't actually have any effect on, you know, the, our analysis. So in those situations, we can, we can be more lenient in which, which method we'll do imputation on. And the other two, and there's actually tests to see if your data is missing at completely at random, but uh, that, that's outside of the scope of our discussion. The next mechanism through which data can be missing is missing at random. And that's when data is missing systematically, but as a function of one of the other variable, variables that we're, that we're looking at. So if our analysis was weight of different breeds of dogs, and for whatever reason, beagles were more likely to give missing readings on the scale that would be missing at random because we can you know sort of do a quasi imputation where we take into account that oh beagles are more more likely to have missing values so we can we can take that into account but that's not super common the the, the two most common are uh missing not at random and missing completely at random and missing not at random is is the the worst worst case worst case scenario it's where the missing readings or missing values are actually a function of the variable itself that we're that we're measuring so wow. if heavier dogs were to like break the scale or give a missing reading for some reason we wouldn't be able to know that that was the reason the data was missing unless we were actually there when the data was collected mm -hmm. so it, it's harder to tell and it's also harder to to deal with that with that type of missing data. Okay, so what we're saying is that what we want to do before we even decide on what technique or to use is we need to understand why our data is missing or what our what our missing data looks like. Is that right? Like how our data is missing. Like it's 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 so important to under, understand the 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 workflow through which we got our data and and 
how that came to our present state of analysis. Okay, so if you if you're working with some data, it's often important then to look at what just look at the data that's missing, so we can see maybe we can see a pattern of some sort, or mm -hmm. is, is that, that that was what you would you would suggest any data practitioner do then, right? Yeah, like, definitely. Okay, cool. Look look at the, the 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 pipeline through which we got our data. So let's I'm just gonna pop open real quick a row sixty fours, um, just in general. So. We have uh, this wonderful section called Re Data Science Recipes here, where once you open up row 64, we have approximately right now 250 built uh, recipes that people can use. Uh, one of the techniques that we're talking about right now is just, you know, before you even employ a, a null value or replacement or imputation, you need to know what, no what your null value is gonna look like. So if you, can, if you want, you can either insert an example if you already have your own data set in here, or you can click on example, which will bring up a sample data set, and it will actually show you uh, immediately. Uh, let me go ahead and put on the Python both here. So you can see kind of the underlying Python code, but you can see the input, what the data looked like prior to um, looking at nulls, and then what the output is. So you can see here the nomenclature or the arguments. Uh, we're just loading a CSV, which, which is this file right here, really small. And then we're, we just want to know what the null values are of column C. And what happens is when you run this, the output is listed here. And you're just isolating out these null values so that perhaps, I don't, I'm just making this up right now. Obviously, it's probably not what this data said, but there's a good possibility that the license are for uh, Atari was just missing. For some reason, we just didn't collect it as an example. So it's important to, to know and understand all of this uh, about any sort of data set before you choose an imputation technique right exactly okay. and and we're very fortunate these days in, in data science to have statistical tests where we can check if data is missing completely at random or missing at random but unfortunately there is no way to check if it's not missing at random cool well this is just one of the great tools would you say that uh, row 64 helps uh data practitioners who are just starting really learn about Python so that they can get into a more uh, sophisticated and complicated workflow? Absolutely. We have we have ways where you can generate reports and, and look at the the distribution of missing values. And it's it's really awesome. Cool. Awesome. All right, I'm going to just close this out and we'll, we'll go back to the presentation. We'll pop in and out of row 64 uh, every now and then uh, just to kind of highlight some of the code and go through more uh, examples. Awesome. Cool. So now now that we know there are those three main types of uh, missing uh, data, what are some of the common techniques that are used? From my understanding, I'm just going to list these out here. Obviously, these are not, um, and I think you would agree too, these are not by any means an ex extensive list. I mean, there's always new techniques coming and uh, old techniques like falling by the wayside. I mean, people, they, they still exist. They'll be here on the list, but this is, people are always learning new things about just AI and machine learning in general. So there's always new, new, new techniques being created. Is that right? Yeah, of course. All right, cool. So list wise deletion uh, is, is one technique. We can also fill uh, or impute using mean and median. We can uh, impute using zero. We can impute with a previous or prior data, prior row in your, in your data frame. You can fill with the most frequent, like on a mode basis. You can fill with what's known as hot deck. You can fill in with uh, KNN or nearest neighbor. Uh, you can fill with, um, this is pretty common. Uh, you could do like a linear regression. Uh, you can do stochastic regression. And then we'll talk a little bit more about some of the new, the other techniques that are like really hot in, um, I guess, the machine learning space right now, especially the, some of the ones that you're, you're, you're studying and um, talking about at at, U, at at UPenn, yeah? Yeah, cool. definitely. So list-wise deletion. Let's talk about that real quick. When do you think um, list-wise deletion is a, is a good? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough question. I, I don't want to ask that. It's like, when, when I guess, is list-wise deletion? I'll just ask it. When is list, what is list-wise deletion and... Wow, did you hear that thunder in the, in the background here? <laughs> Let me close up my window real quick. That is crazy. We got no problem. Thunderstorms uh, where I'm at right now. Okay, 
hopefully they're not it's not too loud and it doesn't rain like crazy here in a bit. Um when is list wise uh deletion appropriate? What is it first of all? So first firstly list wise deletion is just when we throw out any observation where it has a null null value in any of the columns. So if there's a row that let's say let's say there's you know four five predictors that we're looking at and even one of them is null, we're just gonna throw out throw out the entire row. Um, unfortunately, it is very common in the data science world to to uh, just outright do listwise deletion and, and not not look back at any other imputation methods. But we really shouldn't be doing that because there are very, very few situations in which we should be using listwise deletion because it really only makes sense to do when we're missing completely at random all of our all of our null values and it's a very small amount of data that's missing. Wait, are you saying that more data is good? More data is better. Than <laughs> more data is more data is good indeed. Good. So yeah, so let me go ahead and showcase. I guess we can quickly showcase this in um, row sixty four as well. Let's pop back open row sixty four and just quickly show in data science recipes again. You can quickly again just view as an example non null rows and you can see here when we're isolating and pulling out values from the input here we're just kicking out anything that's got a null value right that's just not um it's not it's not a bad uh, it's not bad it's not good it's just like it's not common you'd have to have a from what i'm understanding you have to have a pretty common like a pretty specific use case to employ this technique right yeah and in this example you can see we're throwing out more than half of our data which is is not good practice yeah you would probably want to some sort have employ some some kind of technique that um i mean immediately too i'm looking at this it's weird because you see some of the values here for atari for pac-man and space invaders maybe it's for some reason they didn't just they just didn't record this but you could probably go back at some point and learn how data was collected and then see if we could fill in these null values with a true value right exactly so that's awesome okay cool i'm going to close out row 64 again and we'll just pop right back over to uh our talk and stuff all right next technique uh fill with mean and median um again that is from a average perspective what are you filling with it's you're filling it with a mean an average or you're filling with uh statistically the mean or the median sorry so when the data is skewed it's it's good to what does that mean when the data is skewed? It's good to consider using a median value for replacing missing values. So if you would be able to pop over to the whiteboard for a second, I could actually demonstrate this visually. Awesome. Let me pop open to my whiteboard. So we've got a whiteboard somewhere here. Huh. I wonder why I cannot touch my whiteboard. this real quick and see if I can get a whiteboard going on, on here now. That's bizarre. Let me pop back into my, see if I can get my whiteboard going. Yeah, I can turn my mic up. Can you hear me? Yeah. Let me see about this whiteboard. Open the jam. I think we got this whiteboard going right here, right? You see the whiteboard on the screen right now? Just I want to confirm that you can see it. Yes. Cool. So I've got it open right now. Go ahead and uh, draw, let me draw something to see if you, you can see it. And if you can see it, then uh, I will clear it afterwards. Does that work? Yep. Cool. I can see. All right. So back onto the topic is uh, why um, let me go back to where I'm filling in mean. When the data is skewed, right? Let's do this whiteboard. Show me. What this means when we say, when the data is skewed, it's good to consider using the median value for replacing missing values. So th this is by virtue of the median being closer to the mode when the, the distribution is skewed. So let's say we're looking at a left skewed distribution. Mm -hmm. And is this, is okay, there it's a little bit lagged, but um, okay, so the mean will be further left on the distribution that I'm drawing. 
now. And then the median will be in the middle. Right. Median. And then the mode will be at the, the peak. Right. I'll wait for the for the has to go to space. So I'll I'll let the uh, the drawing come over <laughs> to you. It's, it, I, I see it here. I don't know if you see it on the stream, but um, I'm sure yeah, it's a little bit live on the stream, but that's okay. Yeah. Okay, so so the mode will be the peak of the distribution. The median is is a little bit further left, and the, the means even further left. The reason we would use median over mo over mean in this case is that, well, first I'd actually like to explain that in general when we're doing imputation, we'd like to preserve the shape of the distribution of the data. So. If it's left skewed before, we'd also like it to be left skewed after in, in the exact same you know, shape of distribution. If we change that, then, then we're introducing bias into our analysis and the results could be also skewed. Uh, so you're saying that you want to preserve, what I'm hearing is that you want to preserve the nature of the data set and the way it's acting. You don't want to, you don't want to change any sort of uh, to, so that your prediction, whenever when you're predicting something, is accurate. That's what I mean. That's what I'm hearing. You want to exactly. Preserve, you want to preserve how the data is acting, so that when you make a prediction, it acts in the same manner, right? Exactly. Cool. Exactly. So if if we're looking at this left left skewed distribution and we impute with the mean, which is all the way over here to the left, we're going to be shifting that hump that's by the mode to the left i think there may be a lag on the uh the stream but yeah so i'm drawing arrows if we if you impute values from that mean area mm -hmm. th this this distribution will be moved shifted over to the left a little bit um it will look maybe like this i'm, I'm just drawing there there may be a lag on the stream but doing the median will will shift that less and i think even the mode for this situation may, may be even less uh but that that presents its own issues that we will address when when we come to mode imputation cool well that's great this is a great um drawing i'm uh, really impressed by how your first hump looks almost identical to your second hump and just a shift that's awesome dude. <laughs> So let's uh let's pop over to back over to uh, filling with mean and median uh, on our on our presentation today. When cool. when do you think is this a great technique? I mean, like I can I can see I can see a lot of people just defaulting. Yeah. To this, right. This this is very popular in 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 a lot of uh, analytics pipelines, okay. and like list wise deletion, there there are very specific scenarios in which you would use mean and median but it's definitely not a silver bullet for every single type of missing data we we need definitely a lot of of observations and very few missing observations in addition to missing completely at random it would be it would be the optimal scenario in which to use this okay and again row 64 can help with that because row 64 does have inside of data science recipes, uh, you can replace things with the mean and the median, right? So I'm showing you an example here right now. I don't know if you see my screen, but I just replaced uh, on this data set here, a problem data where you have nulls. I'm replacing it with uh, the mean, right? And this is what I'm talking about, how I think that this is such, such an easy tool to use. So if you see like here, if I'm not, if I'm not familiar with Python, and I'm just, I just want to go ahead and replace with mean. What I wanted to do if I want to learn more about Python is I can quickly change this to the median by just changing the function, changing the, uh, the method here to median, right? Obviously, good um, programming would require you to also change <laughs> everything here so that you're writing code for someone else. When they come in, they read something that they're not, um, that you're not being a terrible programmer, <laughs> right? So something to the effect of this, right? And if you were to run this, 
you'll see that now we've changed it from mean to the median. And this is a type of um, workflow that is great for a, a beginning user, great for a expert because they don't have to go and call the function or write the entire uh, code themselves, right? Right. Yeah. And if you'd actually be able to, to go back to the, the whiteboard, I, I would have one more thing, one more caveat to show about mean and median imputation. Popping over right now. Cool. So if we have a symmetric distribution, my drawing skills may, may need some touching up, but let's say we have this symmetric distribution or you can pretend that it's symmetric. The mean, median, and mode will be at the peak of this this bell curve here. Right. We're talking about like a and, normal distribution then, or something to the effect of a normal yeah, distribution. Yeah, normal distribution, you know, the, the exact one that that is everyone is familiar with. If we were to impute with this this mean slash median slash mode value, mm -hmm. we would be altering the distribution by making the the hump even more concentrated around the mean. So are you saying this hump would become narrower? Exactly. Right. So in a few seconds, the, the diagram will, will appear on the whiteboard. Um, we're gonna be we're gonna be shrinking the variance because for every missing value, we're gonna be imputing with the you know that hump value. So it's just gonna go up and up and up and up, and then the other values are gonna go, you know, by by reference down. Right. So if you, so it'd be if you're trying to predict something, you're obviously skewing your results and creating introducing bias. Yeah. All right. Well, it's I guess it's important then. What how is there is there ever a threshold? for when you do like less than 5% missing, less than 1% missing, is there any sort of threshold like that or not really? I would say definitely less than 1%, you're, you're probably fine to use mean slash median imputation. Okay. Um, less than 5% and missing completely at random, you could probably get away with it. But generally we would try and, and stay away when we're, we are not meeting both of those criteria. Awesome, so at least we have, some sort of roadmap on when some of these tools would be would be useful and when they would be helpful. So, yeah, awesome. Let's move on to, uh, I guess, the next um, imputation technique. Filling with zero. Remember we even talked about this. This was so wild to me. It's like we were talking about when this when this would work. And I remember you were telling me it's like sometimes, man, that's just like the best you can do. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So can you, okay, so oh, I'm just gonna read this out and then we can show this graphically too, okay? So we can fill with zero and we do that because there's nothing else we can do. So we're just trying to shift a distribution to the left from its current place. And doing so gives um, a data scientist an idea that the actual distribution of the data set sits somewhere between where it currently is and where it is after filling with zero, right? I would, I would make the distinction that we're, we're not trying to shift the distribution. It's, it would be that we know the distribution has a lot of values at zero yeah. or that we just have no other option. Like let's say we're doing survey data and, and people are giving answers between zero and five. Sometimes we would just impute with zero because we, we, we don't know what that person would say in, in an answer to that survey. Okay, so I'm gonna try to draw this time because you've been drawing really, really well and I'm way worse than a drawer than you. So I'm just gonna try to make it so that you feel a little bit more confident in your drawing ability because I cannot draw a straight line to save my life. And I have to go so, I'm the worst first person shooter game because I will be aiming for your head, but I'll be, sh I'll be hitting, I'll be hitting nothing. <laughs> so, so my understanding is this, if you have, if you have a distribution that looks something like this, that's not bad actually. It's not bad. <laughs> no, not so, bad at all. What we're gonna be doing is when we fill with zero is that we're gonna have this big spike up here, right? This is like all this value is gonna be like right here, right? 
And what's going to happen is that this 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 thing's going to shift. Something like something like that. Does that look right to you? Did I draw that right? And then I have. I don't. I don't know if the the hump would shift over, but definitely there would be that big spike at at the zero. Awesome, awesome. And sometimes this is like you're saying. This is the best that you can do. It's it's the, it's Gillette, the best a man can get. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I would say I would say also that maybe normal distributions are also interesting and in that they they work well with each other. I'm I'm gonna draw. A little distribution next to yours um but if we're dealing with something like let's say a gamma distribution that it, it kind of you know kisses the y y-axis and then slowly glides down towards the x-axis yep. it'll show up in a few things on the stream if if we're working with something like like this that's that's coming up on the stream right now mm -hmm. maybe it would make sense to do zero imputation um e even in more extreme example would be like if if that that curve was even more pulled in towards the origin it was just like really all zero values and a bunch of small values on the x-axis then it would it would make sense to do zero imputation but i i think there are very limited scenarios in which we would actually use it okay all right well Obviously, we talked about this. We talked about a skews of population really towards zero, and it only makes sense in certain situations. So yeah, we're getting a reoccurring theme here where it's like it almost feels like it really depends. Like you need to know my takeaway so far as someone who is just getting their feet wet in data science is that it just really depends. You really need to fully understand your missing data. You need to understand uh, – distributions, you have to have a background even in statistics. So people that are looking to learn for the first time, the first thing that I would suggest that they do is get comfortable with distributions and get comfortable with understanding statistics, right? Just generally speaking. Definitely. Awesome. Can't recommend it highly enough. Cool. Let's go to the next technique, filling with previous. What is filling with previous? Maybe you take this one. Cool. So I would say there, there's two ways of of the filling with previous. There's there's one where it's for time series data, and then there's one that's that's related to hot deck imputation, which we'll cover soon. The first for time series data is if we have a time series, and in the middle of that time series, we're missing you know two observations, maybe from January fifth to January fifteenth. We're, we're missing, you know, the January 5th and 5th, 10th and 15th observations. Mm -hmm. um, and we're taking observations every five days. We really don't know what value should go in there. So we, we would maybe be able to do some type of interpolation. But sometimes if, if we're doing, you know, a quick and dirty fix, we'll just fill with the previous and it will just be a horizontal line mm -hmm. and jump to the next uh, present value. For the for the hot deck imputation, that would be filling with with data that's similar to other observations. So we would do some sort of sorting of the data set before we do the imputation, mm -hmm. and then fill with fill with the previous one until there's a new observation, and then fill with that continually. So like last observation carried forward, in a way. All right, and I, I know that row 64 does this this technique as well. So I'm just gonna highlight that technique again, or that the data science recipe that sits with fill with previous. So again, open up row 64, jump into data science recipes, go ahead and click on cleaning, and we have fill with previous here. I know we didn't pop into earlier with fill replace with null with zero, but it's here as well. So I can pop in both here and I can kind of show you both of these. So you have two data frames, a quick example on both of them. We're always working with the same same data set here as an example. But again, if you're a data practitioner and you're trying to get your feet wet and you have your own data, there's no reason why you cannot load your own data set. So by all means, load it, you know, and quickly change. If you want to put in point to an actual file path, you can actually click both here and change the file path of the um, the Python as well. So yeah. 
So pretty great for learning Python quickly, right? There you go. Yeah. Let me see, throw in A was zero. Here's the method, right? This is just basically uh, a pandas method and you're calling it when you call the data frame. So it's pretty, pretty, pretty nifty, right? So here's a method here. These are, ar these are known as arguments for people that aren't familiar with uh, Python. So you have a fill in A, it's a, it's a, it's a, I think it's a method. And then inside of the method, you have these arguments that you can basically place in. If you don't have this method equals FF fill, it defaults to another value. So you can go in and you can Google dot fill in A and you can find out what other arguments you can pass through to this method or function. And it will give you all different types of like uh, techniques, right? Yeah, row 64 is so helpful with, with learning how a bunch of different functions can be put together to, to make a useful new analytics tool. Awesome. All right, let's pop over to uh, our presentation again. So fill with previous. We talked about that. Uh, I see here it talks about stock data. Maybe you're joining data from two different sources. Stocks don't trade daily, so you need to do something if you're doing a machine learning algorithm or, or model that's trying to predict something that has some sort of weekend value, right? Um, you need to fill in those values. So, so it has to be something that fills in and it may end up being filled with previous would be the best approach potentially. All right, let's, let's pop over to the next. Fill with most frequent. Let's talk about, we, we talk a lot about numerical data. What's, what's categorical data? Can you just go over that real quick and um, Talk about talk to yeah. me a little bit about fill with most frequent or imputation with most frequent. Yeah, categorical data uh, for starters is just anything that it could be like st strings, which are are just character data. It could be um, representative of like names, different types of cars, different engine configurations. Really, really any type of of data that is best represented by um, something that could be in a category, maybe like colors or different types of food. And it's actually very difficult to work with this type of data just because computers are obviously very good with, with numbers, but they're not the best at, at doing analytics on actual strings of, of data. And we have to, you know, kind of do some encoding to get them to be in the form of numbers so that we can actually do some analytics but something that's that's so great about most frequent is that it does or does work with with categorical data and sometimes it's that's the best we're going to get with the categorical data that we do have awesome okay do you know um let's talk about this uh over representation do you have any sort of example or maybe we we could probably draw that as well couldn't we Right. I think I, I think it would actually be best illustrated by the diagram that I drew before about the spike going even higher and towards the center. Yeah. So you're basically because... you're basically I'm drawing. Oh my gosh! Look at that. How bad is that straight line? I don't know how that kink even <laughs> occurred, but it did. <laughs> so what we're talking about is if you have a distribution like this, right? What we're talking about is that you're if you're filling with most frequent here. Right, you're if if you if you're missing a ton of data, what we're talking about is it going like, it's really spiking up like sharply and then coming potentially back down. Oh God! But <laughs> I hope that that's, <laughs> that's so bad. I gotta draw that again, yeah. man. <laughs> so let's do this again. Oh, dude, that is the straightest fast line that I've ever made. So that is a, that is a good that is a good line. The pressure's on, man. So. <laughs> we're talking about is something like this. It's also a pretty pretty good bell curve. Right? So that's what we're talking about happening, right? No, no, exactly. Good. Yeah. Exactly. And that what we, that what we don't want is this over misrepresentation here. This is just too much. And then you end up if you're trying to predict something that's supposed to look like the bell curve, I mean, that just tells me that you're gonna be wrong every single time except for when you're right here. Exactly. And when you're right here. Right. Unless unless we're doing an analysis of 
we're trying to predict the mean, it, it's not going to be, you know, you're not going to have a good time. Yeah, you might as well just predict using, you might as well fill with mean and median or mean and mode yeah. or whatnot, right? It's the same thing. Yeah. Right? All right. Awesome. I'm going to clear this out. I hope that I can draw the rest of my lines that straight. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hot deck, dude. What is hot deck? I hear this all the time. It's like it's new, right? It's actually pretty pretty outdated, I would say. There, it it, it makes a lot of sense to do, and I, I'm I'm a big proponent of it personally. But nowadays, people are not. There's there's really one gold standard that that is used in academia, and it's called multiple imputation. We'll get to that later. But I like hot deck a lot because it makes sense. Let's say we're working with We'll take, let's take the dog example again. Yep. We're working with different breeds of dogs and their weights. Hot deck would group the different breeds together and then do, let's say we, we set it up. So it would be mean of each breed is, is what would be imputated instead of, you know, the naive mean for all dogs. Um, that would, that would be a more educated guess. And, and that's why, that's the big pro for hot deck is that it takes the other variables into account. That sounds to me a lot like uh, cohort analysis, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, like, isn't that kind of what we're talking about? Like when we, like, here's, here's an example. I got a good one inside of O64, actually. I'm going to use the, uh, the world's most known data set. And that is the, um, I'm sure that maybe you've never seen this data set before. The, the good old pair plot, the good old Iris data set right you've seen this before yeah right? i think everyone yeah has. If, you're, if you're new to data science which i was I, I i was i learned about this maybe four months ago that this is probably the single most widely used uh data set in the world <laughs> right but if you're trying to predict um here here's the power let me let me just showcase some of the power here real quick of uh 064 like i know that if i do hue equals name which is i'm now running a bucket here of um I'm running a hue on this name column here, and I run this. You'll see that row 64 quickly um, using Seaborn will color code uh, the iris flowers for me. And what you're talking about is in the dog example is that you're going to take the mean value of like a specific cohort and apply it to apply it to uh, imputation. Is that right? Exactly. So in let let's look at the the it's a density plot in the third row and third column. Third row, third column. So one, two, three, one, two, three, right here. We're, we're in this this piece right here, right? Petal length, right? Is that what we're talking about? The, there's a big, big blue blue spike on the on the left and a, yes, that one. Yes. Sorry, there's a bit of lag. Um, if we take into account the information that we know about which flower it is and we impute with the mean of that flower that would be a hot deck method that's awesome yeah it's just a it's a cohort analysis and would produce in theory um better results why why isn't it used i guess uh what what's limiting on it is it i saw here we had some like limitations here we had a yeah it's, it's very expensive you're right so what does that mean it, it takes a, a lot of computer power to run and could potentially take a lot of time to run. Mm -hmm. In addition to the fact that, let's let's take that example of the, the iris flowers. If we're looking at that blue distribution and we only have one observation, mm -hmm. the mean is just going to be the number that we have for that observation. So then we would just be using that value to impute every other flower of that type. Well, that makes perfect. I mean, then the dog example, I like that one a lot because there's probably not a lot of variance in like if you're trying to predict the weight of a toy, toy uh, poodle, right? They're probably all right around four to five pounds, right? Right. <laughs> so that's great. So you like you actually like hot deck a lot. I do like hot deck. It, it, it sometimes can be impractical, but in theory, I do like it a lot. Awesome. And it's there's actually there's a famous case of I believe it was utah versus someone uh where they were doing census data and and uh utah was saying that that 
I forget exactly what the case was, but there was there was a big fraud case, and they were saying that that uh, oh they they lost one of their seats in in Congress mm -hmm. because of of hot tech imputation for census data, so they're trying to get it back, and there's a there's a big scandal about that. So this wow. this stuff actually matters. It's it's very practical. That's pretty cool. Okay, nearest neighbor, I, dude, man, I love nearest neighbor. I love nearest neighbor. Yeah. Okay, nearest neighbor is great. Do you love nearest neighbor? Not because <laughs> I, not because you're neighborly and you don't have, you you love your neighbors, but let's talk about ne nearest. What is near, nearest neighbor, dude? Nearest neighbors is if we have a new observation. I'll talk about it in in general terms of you know normal prediction instead of imputation. If we have an observation, actually, maybe it would be best to draw it out on dude, the whiteboard. I, I think that drawing this out would really really help people understand what it is and why it's so freaking cool so hey, i'm gonna help you draw dots on here too does that work with you and i'll do my dots in the red maybe or i know you uh, in blue i'll do i actually have them i have them started out so i'll i'll continue okay that's probably good okay cool probably good let's say we have this new observation in yellow And we want to predict. Let's let's take flowers for the example. Blue would be. I forget what the names are. Iris Setosa. I actually have it up on my screen. It would be Iris Setosa. Iris Iris Color and Virginica. So let's just do Setosa and Virginica. Blue is Setosa, and then red would be the other one. If we have this new yellow flower and we want to classify it, we could look at its nearest neighbors and take whatever is the most common of those and just impute that. And in, in the case of imputation, impute that onto our new flower. Or in terms of actual prediction of the training set being the blue and red and, and the yellow being the new testing data mm -hmm. we would just predict that it's whatever the most of its neighbors look like so the problem with this in in, in regards to imputation is we don't really know how many neighbors we should compare to should we compare to one two three mm -hmm. nine it you know it's it's a difficult thing to to tune that's what we call a hyperparameter actually in data sciences is something that's tuned kind of after the fact and then we kind of go back and you know f finagle our way around the algorithm and see how it performs with different hyperparameters so if we were with three nearest neighbors it would be connected to these two blue and this one red and i think those lines will come up shortly yeah i see them so you're saying that if we're trying to say what blue what yellow is it likely from based off these three nearest neighbors predict that this would be a blue dot. Exactly. Right. And if we're and if we compare to the nearest five neighbors, and I think those lines will come shortly on the stream as well. Yeah, it would still predict blue because it would you still have predict three blue. It would be three to two. Yeah, I, I I do know that in the nearest neighbor um, one when we're talking about it, like if we're talking about from a machine learning perspective, trying to predict which flower it is, but we're sitting inside of maybe the sep the sepal width and the sepal length right here. If you're if you've got something sitting inside of between blue and orange right here, and you have a new dot, and you're trying to predict either green or or orange here, it would be very difficult for the model to to predict something really really well because you can see yeah. both of them are overlap really 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 well it, the better exactly. predictors would probably end up being oh if i only had petal width if i had petal width or length that's when i can really start to predict which flower this is right yeah and that's that's why adding a dimension is always so important like in, in where your mouse is right now currently let's say you know we could pull those observations towards us out of the screen mm -hmm. and for some reason of of that other dimension the the yellow observations were closer to us and the green observations were further away from us. Yeah, yeah. You'd have to we would if, if, if we had something in nearest neighbor and the, and the predicting dot would be 
far to the right, then likely you're talking about it being Virginica, just because that's the nature. Well, of the well not 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 necessarily that example, but like let's say if if we could you know pull those observations toward us or push them away based on some third dimension, mm -hmm. we would be able to to if we could like put a plane through that third dimension, we would be able to easily separate between the yellow and green. Yeah, I, I see that. I can see that. That makes total sense. So this is and that's why that's why this, I is, so powerful. Is, so this is why row 64 is so powerful. You can learn really quickly. And if, imagine if you didn't have that hue in there and you're sitting here at this data set, how do you predict anything? Right? It becomes way more difficult. Yeah. yeah. So, all right, let's pop back over to, um, I'm going to clear our whiteboard real quick. And I'm going to pop back into our presentation. So again, high computational requirements, right? We're talking about something similar to hot deck, right? Yeah, very computationally expensive. And in addition to the difficulty of tuning that hyperparameter K, um, but it is a, a very good algorithm. Right. So what I'm seeing here is whenever we're going back, I'm going back here to our overall techniques here. It seems to me that when you get from the most <laughs> it's almost funny because the most common ones are probably fill with mean median zero previous most frequent and list by solution once you get into like anything that is really good it starts to ha we start to have high computational requirements right yeah we tend so this, is, this is the trade-off yeah right so, but you get better results is what i'm hearing yeah yeah almost always yeah all right, but almost always. See the the qualifiers almost, right? They always uh, we always need yeah. to understand our data, right? We could we could always be over engineering like with with you know some type of crazy advanced you know technique that we're using where it is for you know having 0.05 missing data and it's missing completely at random, you know, it's probably pretty fine to just do mean or list wide deletion. Do you like those two techniques more than uh, regression? those two techniques being hot deck and mean, came. Yeah. I think so. I think, well, the, let's talk about regression for the deterministic case. I think I actually have, I have my, my feelings about regression. I, there are, uh, you know, some requirements that, that need to be met such as like normality and, and heteroscasticity and, you know, other, other statistical requirements for, for us to do regression mm -hmm. that, that are usually not met, but you, you know, you can sort of get around that sometimes and, and get away with it. But I think this, this naive regression of determinism, this determinist where we just impute with that, that, that mean value is not great, but stochastic is, is pretty good because it's it takes not, into account I know, two differences. I, I, I'm going to draw something real quick and you can yeah, of course. in a little bit real quick. I think we, when we were talking about this and I was trying to understand it from just like a statistical perspective, right? What we have, if we were in it, Oh my God, again, that was <laughs> shoot. Okay. So, okay. Not bad. Uh, <laughs> If we've got not a bunch of dots, that's not even a dot, but let's just say we have a bunch of dots here, right? Right. So if we were going to do, and we draw a line, best fit line, that's the best fit line is regression. That's, that's what that is, right? And what we have is if we're trying to predict something, what we find is that if you're drawing this line, what we're talking about, that's just the mean. That's all we have is a bell curve here. We have basically like this, right? And every single time we're trying to predict something, we're predicting the mean value of the bell curve, right? And so when we get, right. I'm just gonna keep going. It's so bad uh, <laughs> and embarrassing. It gets to that. But if I'm trying now to predict values, what I'm doing is I'm always placing it on here, right? I'm just yeah. That's what I'm doing. You're, pre right? you're predicting the expected value of that vertical bell curve. Right. So when I go back to our presentation here, when we talk about um, it does not employ random variation, we're basically just overestimating the correlation between X and Y. What we're saying is that we're just overfitting to the mean, really, is what we're, we're just constantly putting it onto this this mean. Right. Or not mean. Yeah. Median. Median. Right. 
of each of your no mean mean well it's, it's not actually because it's standard normal but yes so eventually that's this basically what you every single value and although great at the first onset of this technique really what happened was out of just sheer evolution of how something needs to occur stochastic regression was created right? yeah and what stochastic regression does is it looks at this linear regression it's, just, it's still here the line is still best fit line is still here but now what it does is it will employ random variation to estimate something along these bell curves randomly it, like it looks at what is it applies some sort of random technique randomization to account for the variation in the standard deviation uh, that's occurring within this data set is that right right so it's gonna it's according to the distribution that lies along that regression line mm -hmm. it's going to either you know increase the expect or not increase it's going to add some delta to the expected value and then do a single imputation on that value or decrease the expected value and then impute that value. But according to that, that distribution that, you know, is being fitted along the regression line. So if I take the bell that, I, that we're talking about here, I should not try to draw over it, but what we're doing is linear regression always predicts at this point here, right? I'm going to predict that. that's We're basically yeah. looking for a random number that then basically calculate will calculate the distance upon which we're going to move away from the mean and apply to either here in this situation we'll put, it would put, put the point here right which if we were to bend that it would be right here on this on this bell curve right right awesome i love it because i'm like it's funny. I'm like asking these questions. I'm drawing these things, and I'm in my real time. But the stream kind of like takes a little yeah, bit to catch up. So I'm like, I don't know, I'm not sure if you agree with me or not. But I think that that's right. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, cool. Yeah. Do you like so? Like, would you ever say that we should use deterministic deterministic regression when stochastic regression exists? I don't. I don't think we should. Right. Because it 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 will over estimate that correlation mm -hmm. and that that can throw off the let, let's say we're, we're going to impute these values with linear regression but then do another linear regression for our actual prediction mm -hmm. uh, i think you have to remember that we're we're still in the imputation space we're not even at the analytics part which is uh interesting i think you know people forget that that data science is is much more than just the actual analytics it's it's data cleaning it's feature engineering mm -hmm. it's it's you know, so much more um when we're doing that final regression our correlation could skyrocket or not our correlation our r squared value could skyrocket it could go down based on the different types of imputation that we do Wait, so, so you're trying to preserve the statistical integrity of the data set by using a stochastic regression that's what i'm hearing exactly we're taking we're taking into account that there is some correlation between these variables and that's what what we're doing by regression is that we're saying you know there's some relationship of you know if we're talking about like baseball teams if you increase spending on marketing you know you're gonna get x more in tickets um that we're we are accepting that there is that relationship but if we say that that relationship is like perfect one-to-one -one, then that could in, in our imputation at least that could mess up our final analysis yeah especially when you're trying to build something that's reliable <laughs> right yeah exactly so all right cool let's talk about um I, I know that those techniques that we just talked about are probably the most common techniques that people use today mm -hmm. and I, I would find that probably the most common of all of them because of the shortcomings of the first five and then you have the shortcoming of just deterministic regression that the two, the three biggest ones that are producing decent results would be hot deck, nearest neighbor, and stochastic regression. What are some of the other techniques that um, exist that are currently being explored today? And can you talk about those? Yeah, of course. So I would say 
the by far the most popular one and the one that's considered the gold standard by academia. I don't know how widespread it is in industry actually is multiple imputations. So I am going to go back to the whiteboard very briefly to explain. Essentially, all of those all of those imputation methods that we were talking about previously mm -hmm. fall under the category of single imputation. So let's say one column that we're looking at has this distribution. It's, you know, in the in the iris data set, for example, for example, let's say petal length is is distributed according to this bell distribution, mm -hmm. this bell curve. Multiple imputation, or all all ten of those those or nine, I think we looked at all nine of those previous methods mm -hmm. are going to pick a single point on this distribution. So let let's say this is the distribution of petal length. We're we're, we're finding some way to mimic that distribution, then we're going to pick a single point based on w w whether it's going to be you know re regression with determinism or st stochasticity we're choosing a single point multiple imputation is completely different in that we're not choosing a single point we're actually mimicking the distribution in a way which is which is a really cool idea we're we're going to you know fit fit that distribution in in a certain way mostly they're doing expectation ma maximization but um we're going to actually create multiple new data sets Instead of having a single value, let's say for for a row of, of that iris data set, you know, there's a flower with petal length one, um, or like one values for all of them except for the one that's missing. Mm -hmm. Instead of just choosing a single value, we're going to actually replicate that row, or replicate the entire data set rather five times, and then fit our model on those five, and then do some sort of aggregation. Oh wow. Really yeah. So you're basically, um, it sounds to me like, uh, it's almost like in the Excel world, we talk about like simulation modeling. Have you ever heard of simulation modeling almost? Is it, yes. Is it yes. similar to simulation modeling where you're just basically running something multiple times and then basically based off what you've learned off of every time you, yes. you yes. Then apply a value based off what you've learned? You're not just going to go. Sim yeah. Very, very similar idea. It's it's almost as if this this point doesn't exist. It's more like it's in superposition. It like doesn't actually exist anywhere on this curve. It it just kind of is a curve now instead of a single yeah, point. Because yeah, you you've run the model like the first one the first time you run it, it lands on this dot here. You're like, okay, I'm gonna take that value. But if you run exactly. it a million times, what you end up finding out is that you get the curve. You get a distribution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's cool. Wild. It's almost like it, you know. It accounts for the uncertainty that we have about this data point. Yeah, that's wild. That's super. Such a great, such a great idea. To talk. I imagine because of that, again, it has some of the same problems that we have with um, nearest neighbor and hot deck, etc. In that, it's is it uh, computationally like high? Is the requirements of it high? So it depends on on what type of uh fitting we're doing mm -hmm. to to get the like distribution mm -hmm. um so it, it can it can really depend but with with the computers that we have today it's not crazy to you know instead of doing a poor analysis spend you know have you have your computer spend an hour doing multiple data sets and then fitting on that to get you know a better result Pretty it's cool. it's not out of, out of the question to do that yeah all right, cool. Let's get into some of the other ones then. Miss Forest. Oh man, we were talking about this for, gosh, like last month. For a long time. Yeah. yeah, that was super cool. Can you explain to um, some of our viewers um, what that is and what Miss Forest is? Yeah. So Miss Forest is something that is actually enabled by SKLearn. and it's one of the iterative imputations. So we're going to start with so just a. So for people that are joining us for the first time that are not data scientists, SKLearn is a machine learning library that exists for Python. And it is one of the, if you're gonna do ML stuff, you pretty much are gonna be, uh, you're gonna know SKLearn really, really well. 
So, but go ahead, continue. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to. Right, of course. No, no, no. Thank you for explaining. Um, Miss Forest is essentially we're going to fit like like linear regression, uh, stochastic or deterministic. We're going to fit a model on the other variables in the data set and then predict whatever the missing value is. And we're going to actually start out with a certain prediction. It could you know start out with with most frequent. It could start out with mean. And then we're going to iterative, iteratively iteratively go through the entire data set and as we we kind of settle on values for those missing for those missing values we're going to stop iterating and then and then leave them be awesome really really cool i think you showed me yeah. a data set where we were talking about like missing car engines and missing what was it like whatever it was and it looked at multiple right. columns and features to in order to determine what the appropriate um value seemed to it was pretty amazing and pretty powerful but when we talked it was it had some shortfalls and the biggest one was it was super computationally uh expensive right so let's it would take it would take like two minutes for a data set of fifty thousand. with i'm not sure exactly how many missing data missing data points were in that data set yeah so if you're working with like 10 15 million rows of data two, three terabytes if, or gigabytes even, it, it can be, it can take a long time, right? Great yeah. Results, super powerful, but again, you know, it, some of the downsides of some of these techniques, you may not have a, a computer strong enough to employ them. What's, uh, who, Bayesian Ridge, um, what's that? Yeah, Bayesian Ridge is similar to linear regression, but it's, it's, um, I don't, I don't know if normalization and, and Bayesian statistics are in the scope of this conversation, but it's, it's linear regression with, with some bells and whistles essentially. Okay. And that's something that you, you, you hear quite often now in, in academia, I'm sure. And, uh, other, uh, uh, machine learning circles right now. Right. So if you're, if you've, right. I guess, I guess the best way to approach this is for anybody that's like watching this and wants to start imputing techniques and go to the best one. The reality is to me, you can't go to be, be, be you can't go to these techniques until you've learned the other the other stuff because you really need to have a full foundation of understanding um, statistics that you're probably going to get when you're employing the other techniques that we talked about previously and it's just a natural way for you to evolve to the next step. So any practitioner that's just getting started, go through what we just went through, the first 10 or 12. Master those concepts and the mathematical concepts that are behind them before you jump into these other techniques because they are more advanced and they do require um, more understanding, right? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Expectation maximization, what's that? So this, this is also... Uh, a higher level statistics concept is essentially um, if we have our data set, mm -hmm. we're going to assume that it's generated by some sort of statistical distribution. Mm -hmm. And the statistical distributions have parameters. So the the bell curve that that people are familiar with has two parameters. The mu parameter which is the mean where the you know the the crest of the bell is and then the sigma print let's draw that real quick because i think mu i think yeah i'm thinking pokemon but that's clearly not what we're talking about we're talking about yeah talking to about the people, uh for mu right <laughs> so right yeah okay let me let me also i'll just draw out the situation okay so we have Ooh, that's a good one. So you, and then we have Sigma, which determines the spread of the distribution, standard deviations, right. Sigma. Sometimes it's actually, um, yes, it's, drawing them oh, yeah. Sig right sigma now. is often the for people that again it's commonly 
known as uh, a nice standard deviation. Standard deviation is nothing more than this squared, right? <laughs> yeah, it depends. It depends. Some textbooks use sigma squared, some use sigma. Um, it's very annoying, actually, when yeah. people use different notations. But, but it's always describing um, the same thing. Essentially, it's, it's describing the variance between uh, and the distance between uh, the space between the mean, basically, <laughs> right? Right. Tightly correlated with right. Singles, right. So, right. Uh, not not necessarily correlated, but how far out everything goes because mm -hmm. there's um, an inequality. Chevy Chev's inequality. I don't know if it's for every. I think it's just for for normal distributions. But sixty five percent of the data in a distribution will lie one standard deviation above and below. So this bar that I that I've drawn on in the middle of the distribution. Mm -hmm. That's one standard deviation below and above. 65% of the data will be in there. Right. If we go another bar out, it will be 60, or it's actually 68 and then 95 and then 99.7. So it just, it's how much of the data is within a certain spread from the mean. How many values, for, how many, how many, Without, how many jumps away from the mean can we go to still have a certain amount of data in our distribution? Right. And we're talking about Essentially, yeah. I think we're talking Expectation about maximization is, we're talking about, yes, 95, exactly. And then if you go out one more, you're talking about, well, then we're talking about like the certain like, not like 99% or whatever, right? Right, 99.7. First. And that's what we're basically talking about. Like how much data, oh, that's cool. That's really neat. Right. Awesome. I'll pull right. back a little so, bit you. Do we need to screen up still? Or should we keep the whiteboard up a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm, I'm just going to explain that, or I'll, try, I'll attempt to explain expectation maximization. Essentially, we're, there's also many more distributions other than the, than the normal, and the, mm -hmm. which is visually represented by the bell curve. But we're, we always assume that our data is generated by one of these or it fits one of these. Mm -hmm. And we can kind of slide this here or fatter to, you know, most closely fit how the data looks. And essentially that's what um, likelihood maximization is, is that we are maximizing the observed of, we're, we're maximizing the, Prob the like the likelihood that uh, we we would see this data. So if you know there's a bunch of points at that mean value, and then you know less points one standard deviation around it, and then even less points around that, and then even less points around that, it's going to be a good fit for for our distribution. But if our distribution is you know like five values to the right, and then all of the data is contained on the left, that's not a great fit. So we're we're just trying to best fit. The distribution to the data that we have and that will allow us to you know get good fits for the parameters and then you know get good fits for the values that we're trying to impute okay that makes sense to me so this seems again for those of you that are new to statistical concept you really have to go through i would say a pretty rigorous understanding of distributions, it's just stats in general, in order for you to even begin to want to employ these types of techniques that we're talking about now. So, yeah. Right. All right. And do you find that most of these uh, techniques, are they, they'd be sitting in probably, in, I would imagine, I, I haven't used these, but they tend to sit inside sklearn, right? So some some of these do multiple multiple imputation doesn't uh, you can do Miss Forest and Bayesian Ridge, mm -hmm. I think they do support expectation maximization. Um, most of the the single imputation ones are definitely covered, but yeah, a lot of uh, sklearn is you know very very popular and. Well, I think isn't uh, K and N uh, sklearn as well? I think it is right. Yes, K and N is is in sklearn. But the majority of these ones we were talking about before require no SK learn. So just 
once you get out and you want to get into SK Learn, that's you're really talking about the majority of them being inside of the auto techniques and the being the more powerful powerful sets of uh, education techniques. Right. Lastly, uh, we have on here. Obviously, I see here you have dot dot dot. There's way more that we could cover that are experimental and you know gaining traction. Can you just lastly tell us a little bit about censored values and what that means? I actually think that might be saved for for another time. Okay. All right. Well, you know what? We could do that in another conversation, another talk. Some of my techniques that we've talked about today. Um, would you agree? The conclusion here is just really depends on. Your data, you have to really understand your data. And the first thing you need to do is look at your data, look at the nulls, spend some time exploring the data to understand the nuances of how your data is acting prior to just jumping in and employing a technique, right? Yeah, yeah. And the best practitioners will spend a significant amount of time to understand their data in order to choose the right technique, right? Yeah. Is there anything else to add today, or is that basically it? I mean, I, I want to thank you for joining me uh, today, Brandon, and I want to thank anybody watching um, for sacrificing their time uh, and 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 coming along with us. Anything else? I think. And that's all for me. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, guys. Again, I'm with my name is Paul Trin, uh, Brand and Brandon Kleinman. We're with Row Sixty Four. If you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to pop up on Row 64's website. We do have forums there where you can interact with us. If you have specific questions on how to employ a technique that's not currently inside Row 64, let us know what techniques you want to see. Um, pop us up. Hit us up with any questions on our forums, and um, we'll be happy to, to answer them. Anyways, thanks again. Thanks, Brandon. I appreciate your time, man. Of course. Thanks for having me. Yep.